Hey friends, welcome back to Bell's Library. Tonight I'm doing my April recap. So I made a video about halfway through the month giving you kind of an update on what I had read so far for April before I left for England. And now I want to go ahead and finish talking about the rest of my reads. I won't go into too much detail about those other reads. You guys can watch that video somewhere here <laughs> and uh, and see what I did the first part of the month. But I want to start in with the book that I was on last time I talked to you, and that is The Murder of Mr. Wickham. So this book is by Claudia Gray. She was a new to me author and I had mixed feelings about this book. Overall, I liked it and I liked it enough to go ahead and go on and order the next book in this series. So this author takes the couples from every one of Jane Austen's novels and puts them together in one house where they encounter Mr. Wickham and the murder of Mr. Wickham takes place two characters that this author uh, has created is Jonathan Darcy, son of Lizzie and Mr. Darcy, and Julia Tilney, who is the daughter of Catherine and Henry Tilney from Northanger Abbey. And so they are the young people in the story. They have been invited to this house with the other couples um, with the hopes of matchmaking by Emma, of course. And so that's kind of how the book sets up. I did enjoy the story, but it drug. It took me a while to get into this. We were 50 pages in and we didn't even know why everyone hated Wickham. I mean, you can get a pretty good idea if you know him, but um, the specifics of why all these other couples who weren't a part of Pride and Prejudice knew him, that wasn't revealed for 50 or 60 pages in. It was over 50 pages before we even knew where Lydia was, which is Wickham's wife, Lizzie Bennett's sister. And so that was kind of, you know, just drug. And um, there was just too mysterious, right? There was no reason for these things to be mysteries. It wasn't crucial to the actual mystery of the story. Uh, another thing that I just kept coming back to is that there are so many characters here that if you are not already familiar with Jane Austen's books and her, you know, her stories and her characters, you're going to get completely confused and totally turned around. And I just kept coming back to that thought, wondering what it would be like for someone who was not familiar with her books uh, to read this. And then when I went to Goodreads, when I was all done and I put my review in and then I went to read the reviews of others, I found that quite a few people uh, did mention that, that they weren't familiar enough with her characters to be able to keep everybody straight. And so it just seemed like this huge jumble pile of people that was, it was overwhelming. I really did like the character of Jonathan Darcy. Uh, he was made to have some peculiarities, as they said in those days. I really liked the way he thought, and I really liked how uh, his, you know, differences in acting or thinking was approached. Uh, there was a quote at one point that said something like, uh, the more we make allowances for peculiarities, the less peculiar they become and the more ordinary they become. And so I just thought that was a, it's a cool way of thinking. I really actually liked the way this author thought about quite a bit of things. Um, but I don't like how she portrayed some of the characters. I think that Lizzie and Darcy came off very snobbish and very out of character, uh, very concerned about the world around them and what the world thought. And that wasn't the Lizzie and Darcy that we ended Pride and Prejudice with, right? We were ended with a couple of rebels. <laughs> and so I didn't appreciate that. I didn't appreciate the uh, super like religious paranoia that we saw in uh, Fanny and Edmund. That's the couple from Mansfield Park. And uh, while Edmund does take religious orders, it just, I didn't know. I, I didn't remember them as being this religiously, you know, whacked out. <laughs> um, but what I did appreciate about the whole religious element in this book is that the author left a lot of room for uh, people's convictions. And so um, while Fanny and Edmund found that they had different convictions on a certain topic, uh, they were able to give 
um, leniency to each other and respect one another's beliefs, even though they were different. And I, I like that. I like how the author approached that. I found the ending of this book to be pretty unrealistic. Uh, it came as a relief, but it <laughs> there is no way that this book would have ended this way without a trial in reality. So I don't know. I did, like I said, I ordered the second book. It should be here anytime. In fact, it may be on my porch now. So I'll have a look at it and see what I think. Okay, and then next after that, I read The Austin Escape by Catherine. Is it Ray? Rie? Re? I don't know why I keep reading this author. I really don't like her books. <laughs> I have read several. I don't know. There's just something that bugs me and I really can't put my finger on it. I just overall do not enjoy uh, her books. And I had a few more on my um, TBR and I just went ahead and I'm just going to unhaul them along with a couple of hers that I've already read that I just haven't actually got rid of yet. <sighs> There's just something that's just not clicking with me. Um, this book actually ended up taking place in Bath, which I did not realize. And I started it on the plane to Bath. So that was kind of cool. Um, but that was pretty much the only cool part <laughs> about this book. Um, so this girl, Mary, she lives in Austin, Texas. So I don't know if we're doing like Austin versus Austin sort of a thing. Um, so she's like an engineer there. Like it's supposed to be the classic, you know, girl doing a man's job sort of a thing when it's, it doesn't have to be, but you know, anyway, uh, so she, her friend gets a hold of her and is like, Hey, I want you to go on this cool experience with me. We're going to go to England and we're going to stay in this manner and we're going to dress up like Austin characters and you have to act like Austin character. It's an immersive experience where we all, it's kind of like Austin land. If you're not, if you're, you know, familiar with that story, um, everybody just acts like Austin characters for the time that they're there at this experience. Um, and so they're going to go do that. Well, they get there and Isabel, that's Mary's friend, she loses her memory and somehow believes that she actually is in the time of Austin and actually is an Austin, you know, character. And so for a few days, acts like when, but it's completely obnoxious. There's no explanation of why she does this. Um, she's just a very mean person. And then it, there's like a love interest that is kind of nonsensical. And then this girl, Mary ends up going back home. And then there's like pages, like 50 pages or something of wrapping up the story where she goes and is assertive um, about her job and things turn out the way she wanted them to do it to at her work. And it is like, like such a contrast. So her job is very sciencey and very technical. And it's just such a contrast from what they're doing in Bath. And it's not even really like they're in Bath. Like they just talk about walking into Bath and that's it. I, I don't know. It just, it was not good. Um, it, I didn't seem to mesh well, the uh, whole Texas experience versus the bath experience. It seemed like two different stories, people doing two different things, and it just drug. I so much did not like this book. I think I only gave it two stars. Um, the more I talk about it, the matter I get. So I want to go back and give it one. So I'm just going to like move on now. <laughs> All right, next up is this story, Sometimes in Bath by Charles Devon. I got this at Topping and Company in Bath. While we were there, I started it there and finished it on the plane. And uh, I did like this book for the most part. It's a bunch of short stories all by the same author. And they all concern uh, people who have a history in Bath. So we've got Bo Nash, we've got Lord Nelson. Um, like I had, there is a story in here about uh, the fictional Mr. Bennett, which is Lizzie Bennett's dad in Pride and Prejudice. Um, Dr. Johnson, just all kinds of different people who have some ties to Bath. And so they're fictional stories. They um, end up kind of mixing other people from that historical time period and telling kind of a little bit of a fantastical story in most cases, but it's fun. Uh, there was a couple in here that I absolutely was not liking at all, but for the most part, I thought it was a great collection of stories. And apparently this guy writes uh, these collections for different parts of England. So I may look for another one by him when I go back. Um, I feel like it was worth it. It was a, it was just a good uh, thing to read while I was there. It was very atmospheric for me to enjoy that. 
Okay, next up was The Pilgrim's Way, a fact and fiction of an ancient trackway by Derek Bright. Now, I got this at Winchester Cathedral gift shop, bookshop. Um, Winchester is a town on the Pilgrim's Way, which was... According to this book, maybe, <laughs> according to signs and local lore, definitely, um, a path that people would take to Canterbury to, I don't know, venerate, worship at the, um, the shrine of Thomas Beckett and uh, just to, you know, whatever you do when you're on a pilgrimage and you get there. That's what they did. Thomas and Beckett in Canterbury. <laughs> but they started in Winchester or near near about. Um, if you have any interest or fascination or little spark of joy in your heart when you're thinking about these interesting pilgrim trails like, you know, the Canterbury Tales um, by Chaucer, that kind of stuff, I would recommend that you like avoid this book like the Black Plague because this was the driest, most boring piece of work that I have read in a really long time. There is no, I, I guess I was, when I read the title here, and I'm not alone, okay, somebody else on Goodreads said the same thing. Reading the title, Fact and Fiction of an Ancient Trackway, like it just makes you feel like, ooh, there's going to be legends and stories and tales and and mythologies and wonderings and questions and mysteries. You're just thinking like it's going to be really, and it's not. It's like, 400,000 different reasons why they took this road as opposed to this road and the roads are three miles apart. Like it's a geographical book really um, and only applies if you even care what path they took three miles apart. Um, so it was just really dry. It was a really a slog. It was also really poorly edited and uh, the author just quoted so many other sources that it was just this compilation of other people's thoughts, really. Um, you know, he missed opportunities. I think he really missed an opportunity to talk about the the modern day pilgrimage that people make going to Chawton and, uh, you know, to Alton and then to, on to Chawton to see Jane Austen's house and the manor house that her brother lived in. There is a Jane Austen house museum there, the entire cottage that she lived in and wrote many of her novels in and, you know, just spent a lot of time in this place that she really loved living in in her older years, um, is all set up with family heirlooms, pieces of history of the area, pieces of history similar to things that she would have had. The whole thing is... Uh, dedicated to her and it's just this wonderful immersive experience of Jane Austen with gardens and all kinds of stuff and then you can walk up the road and you can see the manor house and you can tour that. There's a library in there devoted to women's literature. There's a beautiful um, outside gardens up there at the manor house. Like there is a tea room and a pub and all this crazy stuff and people make pilgrimages. There's a bus that goes from Winchester um, or it's like a nine minute drive. I was like super quick uh, drive from Winchester or they make pilgrimages from Bath and they go on this road, okay? Chawton, Alton were on this Pilgrim's Way path that they were talking about. And I'm just like, he totally missed an opportunity to discuss that, of how cool that is that we are still making pilgrimages on that road, yet we're worshiping at the shrine of Jane Austen, <laughs> as opposed to Thomas the Beckett. So anyway, one star, not a fan. I will keep it for reference, but I did not enjoy this book. However, it did um, have quite a few references in here. Like I said, the guy quoted everybody and their dog. And so there's a couple of books that I did end up ordering um, that I think will be a little more interesting on the topic. So I'll share those in a future book haul video and we'll see if I like those a little bit better. All right, and then last for April was The Dream Woman by Wilkie Collins. He is so great. He is fantastic. This was a five-star read. I went from a one-star to a five-star. He probably got a five-star, mostly because he's Wilkie Collins, and also a little bit because I was just so satisfied to finally read something good after that, you know, difficult book that I just finished. Um, but I loved this so much. It's one of those stories, it's a short story. It's only like 103 pages, and you know where it's going, but you love the journey um, of 
you know, it all unfolding before you. So it's a little bit spooky. It's a little bit fun. It's a little bit funny, very um, accessible. That's the word that's being used lately. It is accessible. Like you can read this, you can understand this. It is not hard. Um, it's a great classic short story by Wilkie Collins, author of Women in White and the Moonstone and so many other great things that I have yet to discover. Um, I love Wilkie Collins. And so I have another of his on my TBR that I picked up also while I was in England. And I may just jump into that here in the next couple of days. As far as I remember, I only have one DNF for this month, and that is the Jane Austen Encounter, uh, which I have already gotten rid of. So I'll put a picture of it up here. And it was a good book when I read it, but it was just moving too slow for me. And I just, I knew the backstory. It was just way too much backstory. When I first read the book, I didn't know very much at all about Jane Austen or England or Bath or whatever. But the book, basically, um, it is a murder mystery, but it kind of follows the Jane Austen tour, right? So say you're going to go to England, you're going to take a Jane Austen tour, you're going to visit God Mission Park, you're going to visit um, Steventon, and you're going to visit Bath, and you're going to visit Winchester and Chawton, and all the different places, you know, um, you're going to do all these things. Well, this book follows all of that. And so it follows the Jane Austen trail, but it is a murder mystery. It's by Diana... Fletcher Crow, I think her name is. And I don't even know how I found this book, but I found it years ago and I loved it. Well, I started it again this month and I just, you know, I'd already read it and there's so much set up, so much backstory set up that I was just getting kind of bored with it. And so I decided to DNF it, um, but I kept it. I'll probably read it again someday, but I just wasn't in the mood for it. And then, like I said in the previous video, which you guys can check out, I'll put it in the description box. Um, I also read The Old Maid. Um, by Edith Wharton, 1066 by David Howarth, In the Wake of the Plague by Norman Cantor, and The Magna Carta by James Dougherty. So if you are interested in my thoughts on those, check out that video. Um, otherwise, guys, I hope you are having a great day. I will see you soon. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.